In mathematics, every true statement relies upon previous statements that we've either assumed to be true or proven are true. But if we have proven them, then those statements depend upon some even prior statements. In order to build a formal mathematical system, we have to start somewhere, accepting certain foundational statements as true without proof. These statements are called axioms. A natural question arises. Where do we draw the line between proof and assumption? If we accept too many axioms, we risk contradictions. Too few, and it becomes challenging to prove anything substantial. Historically, the boundary between assumption and rigorous proof has continually evolved, notably illustrated by the development of calculus. Calculus was independently developed in the late 1600s by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. They introduced revolutionary methods for handling changing quantities, such as speed and acceleration. Yet despite their power, Newton and Leibniz's methods relied on the intuitive yet unclear notion of infinitesimals, quantities infinitely small yet somehow not exactly zero. While the techniques yielded impressive results, their logical foundation remained shaky and difficult to justify rigorously. Throughout the 1700s, calculus flourished and was widely applied in physics, astronomy, and engineering. Mathematicians like Leonard Euler used calculus extensively, but the foundations remained intuitive rather than rigorous. In the early 1800s, Augustine Louis Cauchy took a crucial step toward rigor by making limits central to the subject. He provided more precise definitions for continuity, convergence, and derivatives, interpreting them in terms of variables approaching limiting values. Later in the 19th century, Karl Weierstrauss completed this shift by insisting on fully precise definitions and proofs. He introduced the rigorous epsilon delta definitions of limits and continuity that eliminated the remaining ambiguities surrounding infinitesimals. Around the same time, Richard Dedekind provided a rigorous construction of the real numbers using Dedekind cuts, while Georg Cantor developed set theory and a systematic treatment of infinite sets. Bernard Riemann expanded the foundations of integration, complex analysis, and geometry, influencing many areas beyond calculus itself. Together, the contributions of Cauchy, Weierstrauss, Dedekind, Cantor, and Riemann transformed calculus into the rigorous field we now know as real analysis, the careful study of real numbers, limits, sequences, and functions. As our foundation, we will accept three axioms, the field properties, the order relation, and the axiom of completeness. In this video, we'll discuss the field properties, and we'll discuss the order relation and the axiom of completeness in the next two videos. Let's start by stating the field properties. These statements should feel intuitively true. First and foremost, the real number system, denoted with this script R symbol, is a set equipped with two fundamental operations, addition and multiplication. For any two real numbers, there exists a unique sum and a unique product, each of which is itself a real number. Letting A, B, and C represent arbitrary real numbers, we assume the following five properties. Associativity. When adding or multiplying several numbers together, the way you group them does not affect the result. Commutativity. The order of addition or multiplication doesn't matter. You can switch the order of two numbers, still obtain the same result. Identity elements. There exist two distinct elements, call them 0 and 1, in the real numbers, such that a plus 0 equals a, and 1 times a equals a. We call 0 the additive identity, and 1 the multiplicative identity. Inverses. There exists an element negative a, such that a plus negative a equals 0. Moreover, if a is non-zero, there exists an element 1 over a, such that a times 1 over a equals 1. Distributivity. Multiplication distributes across addition. If you multiply a number by the sum of two other numbers, you get the same result as multiplying the numbers separately by each and then summing the results. We can define subtraction and division by letting a minus b represent a plus negative b and letting a over b equal a times 1 over b, uh, assuming b is non-zero. The colon equals symbol here is used for emphasis to indicate that these are definitions. We can now prove that our typical manipulations of real numbers hold. As an example, let us verify that multiplying fractions works as expected. Before we can jump straight into the proof, it will be helpful to prove two simpler statements that we can use to help us with the main proof. In mathematics, preliminary results like these are called lemmas. Lemmas help make the main proofs cleaner and easier to follow. If a and b are real numbers and a, b is zero, then either a is 0 or b is 0. Let's prove this. Let a and b be real numbers, 
and assume that AB is non-zero. In the case where A is zero, the result is immediate. So assume A is non-zero. Now we need to show that B is zero. Since A is non-zero, there exists a multiplicative inverse, one over A, satisfying A times one over A equals one. Multiplying both sides of the equation AB equals zero by this one over A, we obtain this equation. Using the associativity of multiplication, we can regroup the terms, first multiplying the one over A by A, and since one over A times A equals one, it follows that one times B equals zero, which implies B equals zero. This completes the proof. Now let's state and prove the second level. Every non-zero element has a unique multiplicative inverse in R. We'll prove this by assuming that we have two inverses and then showing that they must in fact be equal. So let A and the real numbers be a non-zero element and suppose that B and C are both multiplicative inverses of A. It's always a good idea to use the definitions of any terms in the theorem or lemma to translate our hypothesis into more symbolic statements. So by the definition of the multiplicative inverse, AB equals one and AC equals one. By associativity and commutativity, order and grouping of factors doesn't matter. So if we consider a product of all three, A times B times C, this should be able to cancel out in two different ways. On one hand, the A and B can cancel leaving C, and on the other hand, A and C can cancel leaving B. Let's write this out as a string of equalities connecting B to C. Observe that B is equal to B times one, is b times a times c, is b times a times c, is 1 times c, is c. Since we started by assuming we had two inverses, and we've now shown that they're equal, we're done. Every non-zero element has a unique multiplicative inverse. Now using these two lemmas, let's prove that multiplying fractions works as expected. In symbols, we need to show that given real numbers a, b, c, and d, with b and d not equal to zero, that a over b times c over d is a, c over b, d. We'll start by using the hypothesis that the denominators are not zero. Since B and D are non-zero, the field axioms guarantee that their multiplicative inverses, one over B and one over D, exist. Let's now rewrite the symbols on the left-hand side using their definition. By the definition of division, we can rewrite A over B as A times one over B, and we can rewrite C over D similarly. Using the associativity and commutativity of multiplication, we can rearrange the terms grouping A and B together and 1 over B and 1 over D together. Next, note that since B and D are non-zero, their product is also non-zero by our first lemma. We now need to show that 1 over B times 1 over D is the multiplicative inverse of BD. Using commutativity and associativity, we can start with the product BD times 1 over B times 1 over D and rearrange so that B and 1 over B become 1 and D and 1 over D become 1. By the uniqueness of multiplicative inverses, our second lemma, it follows that 1 over b times 1 over d equals 1 over bd. Substituting this back into our earlier equation and using the definition of division to rewrite the right-hand side, we can conclude that a over b times c over d equals ac over bd, proving the result. These five field axioms that we've been using turn out to be quite powerful in proving all sorts of typical manipulations of real numbers. It is a useful exercise to do this for a few other statements. For example, Using only the field axioms, can you prove that adding fractions works as expected? That a over b plus c over d is always ad plus bc over bd, provided b and d are non-zero? Assuming we define integer exponents in the usual way, can you prove that squaring binomials works as expected? That a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. What are some other examples of statements that can be proven from the field axioms? Can you think of any statements that feel like they should be true about the real numbers, but that are impossible to prove from the field axioms? Part of our goal in this journey is establishing a solid toolkit so we're not reinventing the wheel every time. Moving forward, we'll just accept all of these typical algebraic manipulations as justified. In the next video, we'll discuss the order relation, our second axiom. And from it, we'll prove the triangle inequality, a simple yet really powerful statement. I hope to see you there.